Okay, so this is chapter 10 from the Huther book, and it is the pathophysiology of cancer. Um, so another word for cancer is neoplasia, and that's really, I mean, if you break down that word, it means a new, uncontrolled, uncoordinated growth that is not under physiological control, because neo means new. So um, if we look at, so really, I mean, if you want to know what cancer is, it's when cells just sort of grow unchecked, out of control, and they just kind of take over. Now, they can be benign and malignant, and we'll get into what each of those means. Um, but if you look here, you can see, I mean, some of the epidemiology and how cancer affects people. You can see that, you know, number one on the list of new cases of cancer, but it doesn't mean deadliest, that's down here, but of new cancers, uh, breast cancer is most prevalent in females and prostate in males. It's almost like a karma thing because th these are cancers that really uh, some men can, yeah, get breast cancer because they do have some uh, breast tissue, but uh, but prostate gland is pretty pretty exclusive to to males. Now, but that doesn't really lead to death in a lot of cases. You can see that only, I mean, 28% of new cancers, but only 10% of deaths are from prostate cancer. Really, in both males and females, lung and bronchi cancer are, are the big ones, okay? So the big killers. Um, and you can kind of look through this. You don't have to know everything about it. Uh, but I will say that it does exclude skin cancer. Skin cancers are the most common forms of cancers, particularly uh, like uh, squamous cell uh, carcinomas. Um, melanomas are the are the really bad ones. But uh, but that's uh, but that's this graph is just excluding those skin cancers. So cancer in in general, I already kind of said this is diseases in which abnormal cells divide without control and are able to invade other hosts or other tissues. Uh, derived from the Greek word for crab, which is um, this word apparently, and um, and that's the star sign for cancer, which is a crab. So tumor, it's also a tumor, also referred to as a neoplasm, which is a which is a new growth. So a neoplasm is a tumor. They can be benign. Tumors can grow that aren't necessarily malignant or cancerous. Okay, so uh, cancer is predominantly a disease of aging. We say that because it takes several mutations, usually, uh, to, to, for a cancer to develop. And um, now some people have mutations already or are more susceptible to forming cancer, so there is a genetic component. Uh, but in general, they have to kind of build up, which takes time, which is why uh, the statement is here. Now we know that uh, children can be susceptible to cancer, uh, especially some of the blood cancers. Uh, which we'll talk about in a different section. So clonal prolifer proliferation or expansion. Clonal just means the same cell divides and then divides again and then divides again and again and again. Okay, so that's that's what that what well, that's what that means. And then you end up with a uh, pretty rapid growth, which we'll also see. So as a result of a mutation, so a mutation means that something on the DNA was changed, so one of these bases was changed somehow, and you either ended up with something that functioned too much, or something that didn't function enough, or didn't function at all. Okay. Uh, so as a result of a, a gene mutation, a cell acquires characteristics that allow it to have selective advantage over its neighbor. So when you have this cell that is dividing and sort of pushing all the other cells, like it just doesn't care, uh, pushing all the other cells out of the way, taking up resources, then that's going to cause tissue death of other cells in the area. So it's caused by an increase, increased growth rate or it's dividing normally, we could say that, uh, but the cells, the old cells aren't dying. It's just building up and up and up. So it's either increasing the growth rate or it's decreasing the death, the apoptosis. They're not, they're not dying off, or it could be both, actually. Okay, so neoplasms can be, so tumors, um, can be benign or malignant. Benign, this, this term well differentiated, kind of need to pause on that. So, so cells have a particular identity. I mean, we've, we've all seen in, you know, biology labs or physiology lab, we, we've all looked at cells like a squamous cell or a columnar cell, and we can see certain characteristics of that cell. Um, and that's a well-differentiated cell. Now, cell. Now, benign tumors 
can are usually well differentiated. You can say, okay, well that's a that's a glial cell, like in a brain tumor. There can be benign brain tumors, a glioma. So we can say, okay, that's that's a a glial cell, and and that's that's just what it is. And so that's usually going to be uh, considered a benign tumor, um, even though they can still they can still grow. Um, they're just they're just not as invasive as as a uh, malignant cancer. So they resemble the normal cell, but they can't control their cell proliferation. So they're still growing out of control. Uh, they just happen to have uh, maintained some kind of cell identity. Now, a malignant tumor, it's it's lost both proliferation and differentiation. So it's very difficult sometimes to just look at a cell, a cancerous or a malignant cell and be able to tell what kind of tissue it was. You can, you can do it a lot of times by, by looking at markers because, because the proteins that are on there may be the same and so you can kind of trace it back and you can say, okay, well this used to be a glioma cell, uh, but now it's mutated to, to be something, something that's really unidentifiable. Um, even though, even though, like I said, there are markers that can, can help uh, uh, histologists or patho, pathologists uh, identify them. Okay, so a malignant is usually what we refer to as cancer. Uh, they often do not mature and differentiate normally to do the job the tissue is supposed to do. So whatever it was supposed to be there for, whatever that original cell started out to do, it's not doing it anymore, or in some cases it's doing it too much, like producing hormones or something. So they grow in the absence of growth factors. Now, um, we haven't talked a lot about growth factors, but a growth factor is some kind of chemical signal that says that, that will activate a cell, so here's a cell, that will activate a receptor on a cell and tell that cell to start dividing. Okay. So growth factors are handy because sometimes we like when skin regeneration or something like that, growth factors have to be released to say, okay, we need to start growing skin here. But then there are growth suppressors that say, okay, there's enough skin, we can stop growing. Okay. So cancer, uh, malignant cancer, malignant tumors, uh, have to overcome that, that limit of, of needing a growth factor. So sometimes they can just do it without a growth factor. Sometimes they actually make their own growth factors, which stimulates their own growth. But somehow they need that, that signal activation uh, to do it. And they also evade apopt apoptosis, which means that they don't die naturally as a, as a cell would. And there are lots of reasons for that that we'll get into. Okay, so first of all, naming tumors. That's, that's kind of a... Uh, a sticky business. It can be a little bit complicated, but but not really as long as as long as we obey the rules. So the general rules: uh, neoplasms are often called tumors, uh, named from the parenchymal. Parenchymal just means the functional tissue from which they were derived. So it's if it's a uh, whether it's a nerve cell or a muscle cell or something like that, the name is from that particular that particular cell type. Okay. Uh, benign tumors is the tissue name, and there are some examples on the next page. The tissue name plus oma. Okay, so like I was talking about glial cells right now, so a glioma. Okay, malignant tumors have are, are a little bit more complicated. So if we remember benign tumors, tissue name plus oma plus oma. Uh, I'm not going to try to throw anything at you that's going to really break that rule. Uh, but there are a lot of rules as far as malignant tumors go. If it's epithelial tissue, remember epithelial tissue is like skin, but it can be also skin around a blood vessel, or it can be skin around the kidneys, or, you know, some that's epithelial tissue is a covering type of tissue. Um, so it's the tissue name plus carcinoma, okay? So, uh, and that's that term carcinoma is pretty exclusively for epithelial types of tissue. So if it's from squamous cells, then it's squamous cell carcinoma. So that's an example. If it's glandular tissue, so something that is secreting something else, then it gets the tissue name plus adenocarcinoma. So that adeno is added to it. And if they're from melanocytes, then we call them a melanoma, which is, which is again, remember, this is a malignant tumor, so it kind of looks like it's obeying this this benign tumor rule, but and and you could argue that it is, but it doesn't matter because a melanoma 
is made from melanocytes, which are those uh, pigment producing cells that are in, in our skin, that are just kind of scattered through our skin. Um, but those are a melanoma, and a melanoma is malignant. So mesenchymal tissue, which is uh, connective or soft tissue, so we, without going through all the different kinds of connective tissue, but that does include bone. Bone is a type of connective tissue. Soft tissue would actually include muscle, then, and this is going to be most cancers, actually. It's the tissue name plus sarcoma. So if we look at some, some examples here, uh, here are benign tumors, and you can see that most of them obey this rule. So uh, papilloma, papillary cells, um, adenoma, glandular, remember, glandular gets this adeno on there. And if it's benign, then it's an adenoma. And if it's malignant, it's an adenocarcinoma because it's epithelial cells. I know, it's confusing. Um, and then we have these connective and soft tissues. Um, which can includes these connective and smooth muscle. And you can see that if it's fibrous, it's fibroma, lipoma for adipose tissue. And if it's cancerous, then it's fibrosarcoma. And then osteosarcoma, so that SAR, makes a big difference between a malignant tumor and a benign tumor. If I say this is an osteoma, then that's going to be benign. If I say it's an osteosarcoma, then we know that it's malignant. Okay, um, so let's see if we move down here. Uh, smooth muscle, so that's that's obeying the rule. Lyomyoma and lyomyosarcoma. Okay, um, let's see neuroma, neuroblastoma. Okay, so the name name changed a little bit there. Um, and uh, some of these some of these do. I I usually don't. I wouldn't test on that just because I'm not trying to trying to trick you. But um, but some of them had names to begin with. A blastocyst is just something that can you know it's kind of a newer cell. It can become a lot of different things, or it, or it can become that type of cell and divide a lot. So those can get cancerous. But that's where that name comes from. Now, if we move down here, we see we see hematologic, which means blood, and those are the leukemias, the lymphomas, and the myelomas. And we're going to cover that when we actually talk about blood. Okay, so we're not going to talk about these right now specifically. And then the endothelial tissue, blood vessels, hemangioma, hemangiosarcoma. So they're, they're obeying the rules as well. So you can see that most of these have sarcoma as part of their names. Uh, the carcinomas are the epithelial tissues there. Okay, so what is a benign tumor? Contains cells that resemble the normal tissue, so they're well differentiated, may perform the normal function of the tissue, which isn't always a good thing. Okay, so uh, if you have a benign tumor that's secreting hormones, like in a, a pituitary tumor or something like that, and it's producing hormones, that's really going to kind of mess with, with the, uh, the physiology and the growth a, a lot of times of that person. Um, because it can lead to oversecretion, like if it's, if it's overproducing growth hormone, then you're going to have somebody that's, uh, you know, that's going to grow too much and they're going to be, to be very large. Uh, benign tumors tend to grow a little bit more slowly compared to uh, uh, metastatic or uh, malignant tumors. Uh, surrounded by a fibrous capsule, another big important thing. I mean, think about what that's doing. It's it's it. There's there's fiber and there's a there's fibrous uh, proteins that are surrounding this and kind of encapsulating it. And so that's kind of nice because malignancies is when it kind of reaches out. And, and then starts to kind of uh, metastasize or, or spread, these, spread these cancer cells all over the place. But a benign tumor tends to be encapsulated, and, uh, and that's going to control how, how much it migrates. Okay, so they don't infiltrate, they don't invade, and they don't metastasize. Metastasize is just when it spreads to a different area. But that doesn't mean they're safe because especially like with like a glioma, they can damage nearby organs compressing them. And in this case, in the case of a glioma, glial cells, that organ is the brain. Okay, so it can cause damage. They can cause damage, but sometimes they can just grow and grow and grow and uh, become very large and, uh, and they don't necessarily just kill people. Okay, some people can let them get really out of control. All right, so... Now, those were benign, that was a benign tumors, or those were benign tumors. 
Now malignant tumors contain, contain cells that do not look like normal adult cells, so they are not well differentiated. Um, they don't perform normal functions of the tissue. However, they may secrete all kinds of random things. They may secrete signals, enzymes, toxins. They could do all kinds of things which can damage the surrounding tissue, which is where a lot of the damage and where a lot of the pain comes from with, uh, with cancers, is that they're damaging the surrounding tissue and, and that can be, you know, that can be painful. Autonomously, that means without any help, all by themselves, proliferate means divide rapidly and can continue to mutate. So there we go. We have a cell that has somehow figured out how to keep dividing and it does keep dividing rapidly and it can continue to change. So it's hard to kind of chase those down. And sometimes the fact that they can continue to mutate is kind of an important point makes them kind of difficult to kill. Um, you know, especially if you're trying to be specific toward a toward a tissue type, like with an antibody, trying to kill it with an antibody, if they mutate, then they might they might be harder to kill. Okay, so malignant tumors lack capsules, so they don't they aren't encapsulated like the benign tumors were, and they send little legs. And the this is a a picture down here. You can see the legs coming out. It looks like a crab, which is how it got its name. Um, somebody drew that. It's not just a picture, so it's kind of idealized, but um, but yeah, it's got the it's got the legs. It looks like a crab, and um, and then it can infiltrate, invade, and metastasize to distant sites. So this infiltration, really, in and of itself, when it's starting to sort of push those legs out in between other tissues, can make it very very difficult to remove because it's really hard to get a uh, to to see where the edges are to to that particular cancer. Um, and these two can compress, but they can also destroy surrounding tissues uh, just by their infiltration. Okay, so here's another here's another graph that sort of shows these. I'll let you uh, you look at it. Um, I will say that this part here, this is low mitotic index and high mitotic index. That's just how fast they divide. Okay, so that's that's cell division. So malignant have high mitotic index, which means they divide rapidly. Okay, uh, so two categories of malignant tumors. Uh, there are solid tumors, okay, neoplasms. There are solid tumors, which is a lot of times what we think of, initially confined to a specific tissue or organ, but then they eventually invade and break through and may metastasize by entering the blood and lymph systems and spreading to other places. And that's what you can see here. So you see this solid tumor. Uh, that may, you know, when you palpate it, may feel like a lump, but then you can see that as they divide, maybe some of these are escaping into the bloodstream, and then who knows where they're going to go. They could, they could get caught up in the lungs, they could make their way to the liver, uh, they could even move to the brain, okay? So, so these can, uh, so metastasis is, is not a good thing. Hematologic cancers, like I said, we're going to talk about those more specifically in a, in a later, later class, um, but hematologic cancers involve cells normally found in the blood and the lymph, so they're disseminated from the beginning. They're spreading all over, except that they're blood cancers, and so they tend to, they tend to stay in the blood, but, uh, but that, can be a, that can be a big problem. You can't just remove them. Uh, so that's one of the one of the problems. Uh, an example of hematologic or blood cancers is leukemia, leu leuco meaning white. So those are white blood cells, okay. And lymphocytic leukemias or uh, or like a lymphoma, but le lymphocytic leukemia are specifically B cells and T cells, and mostly B cells. Okay, so do you see the difference here? Leukemia, cancer of white blood cells, it's more of a general statement. And then you have lymphocytic leukemia, which means that you have what? Uh, B cell and T cell involvement. I'm just, I keep pointing to B cells because it's usually B cells. Um, but they can form what are called lymphomas. Remember, the lymphocytes are the B cells and T cells. Okay, so ideally when we catch cancer, and this is um, the case a lot of times with cervical cancer, is that we find something called cancer in situ. Okay, so even though this is a malignant tumor, it's still localized and it hasn't started to be invasive yet.
Okay, so the cancer hasn't crossed the basement membrane. This is the basement membrane down here, and all these cells are kind of growing from that and attached to that basement membrane. And then this tumor cell starts to starts to divide, and then it will sort of spread in that area. Okay, and so that's the ideal time to catch it is when it's still in situ. This is showing uh, it in breast cancer here. And you can see that it's encapsulated. It's or not encapsulated, but it hasn't crossed that basement membrane, so it hasn't metastasized. Uh, compared to the next picture, and this is a pretty basic picture, but you can see where it has moved out. And so it's uh, it's moved past that cancer in situ. And I think in situ, like in situation, it's still in its initial situation. I don't know, it's a way to remember it. Okay. Um, so malignant neoplasm characteristics, genetic instability, okay, they, you know, usually there are lots and lots of checks and balances in place to make sure that cells divide the way they're supposed to and that they survive the way that they're supposed to and die when they are supposed to. Uh, cancer cells seem unable to correct errors in division, which opens them up to mutations. Uh, some of them may have multiple copies of chromosomes. They're just pretty messed up cells to begin with. Um, gene mutations, and I'm going to come back and talk about this, these things a little bit more. So these gene mutations have to be kind of specific for certain things, and one of those is growth regulation. Uh, when you have cells that are growing out of control, it kind of makes sense that a mutation would happen in something that regulates growth. Now, also cells go through a cell cycle, you know, the G1, G2, uh, G0. So they go through these this cell cycle and then when they're told to they they stop and they'll enter something that I'm going to refer to as G0 and that means no growth. Okay? So that means they're just sitting there doing nothing, just doing their job. A lot of liver cells, if you think about liver cells, they're not constantly dividing, they're just being a liver cell. Uh, which means that they're in a G0 phase. Well, guess what? Cancer cells never get to this non-growth phase that I'm calling G0, or that's called G0, actually. Um, okay, so growth properties, cancer versus normal. Malignant tumors can divide without growth factors, without growth factors from elsewhere. So they don't have to get a signal from anywhere else. Not really. Um, as I said before, some of them will make their own growth factors. And sometimes they just produce a ton of receptors, okay? So that's like, I mean, so if, for example, if, you know, there are supposed to be 10 receptors, they're going to get some signals, some stray signals every now and then they're going to cause them to grow slowly. Well, if they put down, you know, a thousand receptors, then they're going to be a lot more sensitive to any kind of growth factors that do show up. Okay, so that's going to cause them to grow more rapidly. Uh, but in general, they either they either make their own or they just activate they just activate their own uh, the, their growth receptors are just activated. Okay, um, the uh, growth factor receptors are just active, just constantly. Okay, so uh, others produce numerous, sometimes already active drugs based on antibodies have been developed to block the receptors. So these are those uh, like monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies I mentioned. Um, but yeah, you can make antibodies that will just bind these receptors and that'll stop that growth signal as long as that's what's leading it. If the growth, if the growth factor receptor is always active, then that's maybe, maybe it'll work. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so there are a couple of other things characteristics of cells. Um, cells usually grow in groups, in bunches, and let's say that this cell right here, we'll say this cell right here in the middle, becomes cancerous. Now normally that cell will just say, oh gosh, I'm surrounded by cells. There are cells everywhere around me. I'm going to stop growing. That's called cell density uh, dependent or contact inhibition. It's inhibited from growing because there are other cells around it. But in a cancer cell, if it becomes uh, cancerous then or malignant, it's going to say, I don't care that there are cells around me, I'm going to grow anyway. Okay, So that little signal that it's getting saying, no, you can't grow because you're surrounded by cells, 
it will ignore that signal. So they lack that cell density dependent or contact inhibition that normal cells possess. So you know, most normal cells stop dividing. If, they, if their environment becomes crowded, cancerous cells do not. Anchorage dependent, so that's something else. Remember that basement membrane we were talking about, and then you have cells that are growing kind of attached to that, um, or at least getting signals from other cells, and these cells are all you know, pretty happily growing. Okay, that's supposed to be a smiley face. So they're all happily growing because they have the things around them that they're supposed to have. Okay, um, if, if one of them breaks free, then that cell will die. Okay, that's the way it's supposed to work. These cells aren't supposed to be able to break free from where they originally were. If a if a liver cell breaks free and starts moving through the blood, it's supposed to die. Okay, because it's not getting the signals from its neighbors saying yes, you're in the right place. Well, guess what? Cancer cells they will grow anyway. I don't know what that is, uh, but they will continue to grow anyway, and they can. That's what allows this uh, metastasis to take place. Okay, so that's Anchorage Independence. They don't care. I mean, they they don't care if they're growing in the wrong place. Okay, um, cancer cells are immortal. So there's this really cool trick at the end of every. So if we look at, we'll draw it kind of like this. If we look at the end of your DNA, at the end of your chromosomes. Right at the tip, there are these little things called telomeres. They don't really code for anything. They're just sort of there. Okay? And every time this chromosome replicates, part of this goes away. Okay? So every time these telomeres, that's what they're called, telo meaning tele, far, I guess, whatever. Um, but, but these telomeres are, will, will kind of get shorter and shorter and shorter. And after about, I don't know, around 45, 48, 50 divisions, they can't do it anymore. Okay, They're done. And that means that cell will die. Right? So that's sort of this natural progression. A lot of people say, oh, if we could stop this from happening, then we could prevent aging because it is kind of associated with aging. However, uh, you can also create tumors, which is probably the more likely outcome. Because if this doesn't happen, then that cell can just divide and divide and divide forever. There is a, an enzyme, it's called telomerase, which will rebuild that telomere. Okay, so even if even even when that telomere loses um, part of it, telomerase will just stick it right back on there. Okay, so it loses part and telomerase says, oh, I see you're missing part of your telomere, and puts it back on there. And that's what has to happen for a cancer cell to keep dividing. Okay, because because, I mean, let's think about how this happens. When a fetus, an embryo, is, is developing, it's supposed to just divide and divide and divide. It can't be limited to just 48 uh, cell divisions. It has to keep dividing. And so that's why this enzyme exists, because there's a part of everybody's life where rapid and continuous cell division has to take place. But then this telomerase in most cells is switched off. And so it, it, which is going to allow those cells to die. Um, cancer cells turn it back on. They turn it back on and those telomeres don't go away and the cell is able to keep going. Okay, so um, the cell cycle in general, um, normally the number of cells produced equals the number of cells that die. Okay, I mean, I mean that has to happen, right? Because we, gener we regenerate liver cells on a pretty regular basis. It's not like we do skin cells. Skin cells are just dividing constantly. Liver cells, you know, if you lose some, you can replace them in general. Um, but we don't want our liver to just sort of grow and grow and grow and take over. So at some point we reach an equilibrium and where the number of cells that are dividing equal the number of cells that are dying through apoptosis. Okay, so it's a natural type of type of thing um, that keeps the total number of cells in the body approximately constant. But in cancer, cells increase their proliferation frequency. Okay, so they're dividing faster, and or they don't die when they should. Okay, and that's what I was calling, uh, and also remember earlier I said G0 is where they just sort of stop dividing and they just do their job. 
Okay, so so fewer of them will also enter that G0 phase. They're they're just dividing and they're dividing and dividing. Okay, and and they're not really paying any attention to, and nobody's not really dying. And so that's what the tumor is all about. Now what that means is there's something called a growth fraction. And that means that the number of cells will increase exponentially. Okay? Now this is, a, this is a problem. So there are people who are diagnosed with, uh, let's say somebody goes in with a lump, and maybe they've had this lump for, they've noticed it for a couple of months. I've known somebody that noticed a lump for uh, nearly a year. And, um, and they go in and they say, okay, well, you know, you have, you, you, you have breast cancer, okay? I'm sure there would be more to it than that, but, but you have breast cancer, and they will start them in many cases, most cases, I would, I would guess, um, but they, they would start them on chemo or radiation. They'd start them on treatment right away because of this exponential growth. They don't want the tumor in just a short period of time to end up this large, okay? Now maybe it's a slow, it's slow growing, uh, but maybe, but maybe not, or maybe it just um, <clears throat> uh, but has the capability of being more rapidly growing. Either way, it's not something that uh, that uh, most oncologists want to take a chance on. So they'll they'll try to stop that growth and shrink it as as quickly as they can, if they can. Okay, so um, growth factors. We mentioned earlier about growth factors. Cells only divide when they are told to do so. Okay, so they have this little receptor on their surface uh, that will tell it, and it needs a it needs a growth factor signal from somewhere that will then tell it, okay, yes, you can you can divide. And when it gets that signal, it divides. Um, so that causes stable cells uh, to enter the cell cycle and divide. That's what the whole point of growth factors are. Uh, cancer cells seem to function on a more primitive level. Now remember earlier when I said an embryo and a fetus, they need to, they're supposed to divide. They're supposed to be dividing and dividing and dividing. Okay, so they, they have growth signals. Their growth, their growth signal receptors are activated. They're not losing their telomeres. All of the things that require rapid and continuous cell growth are already programmed into everybody's cells. Okay, does that make sense? The, the um, fetal genes, um, are certain fetal genes, embryonic genes, are turned on that allows that continuous cell division. Um, also, the immune cells, you don't want immune cells to start taking out cells that are um, that are rapidly dividing in a fetus. Okay, you do want that in an adult. Now the trouble is, what happens is, and that makes it sound a little bit less complicated. Actually, is all you have to do is kind of turn back the clock on these on this gene expression, and you have the cell turn on and convince the environment around it that it's just a little baby cell. Okay, so it's just a it has it so it starts to produce these fetal antigens which will signal to a cytotoxic T cell that, you know, might come by and might be a little grumpy and might look at this and say, hey, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And it says, okay, you know, it's going to see these fetal antigens and it's going to say, okay, you're fine. And it's going to move on and it's going to let those continue to divide. Okay. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So they avoid detection from immune cells because they produce fetal antigens and those fetal um, some of those genes that are turned on are also what's allowing it to keep dividing. All right, so we've been throwing around this word metastasis, so I guess we can define it here. Uh, cells in a primary tumor lose adhesion and develop the ability to escape, okay, travel, and survive to develop a secondary tumor. Okay, so that means they were growing in one area, um, and they and they broke free and they started growing in another area. A lot of times that happens like breast cancer may, might move to lymph tissue. Lymph tissue then uh, could move to other areas and it can metastasize uh, to the lungs or to the brain or to the liver or many other places. So although tumor cells continue to mutate, they maintain some of the characteristics of the primary tumor from which they were derived. Um, so um, what what that means is that they they maintain some of the characteristics, which means they may not look like anything that's recognizable, but they do have some of the same 
uh, protein expression. So they, they can be traced back, uh, but they do they still change. So it's usually possible to determine where a tumor originated based on its morphology, what it looks like, and expression of proteins. Okay, so if you see a cell cells that are kind of you know shaped in a you know random but a certain way, certain size, you can kind of tell from that. But most ex most importantly, you can tell from protein expression. You can say, okay, this metastasized your breast cancer tumor metastasized and now that's in the lymph. Why is that important? Because we want to make sure that it is a metastasis and not a brand new tumor that's growing. Okay, um, Not that one is any better than the other. I would guess that uh, a metastasis is better because then you can kind of have the same basic treatment strategy. Um, but yeah, so metastasis, metastasis obviously takes place via blood, but it also takes place via lymph. So sarcomas, okay, so remember sarcomas are from soft tissue, uh, metastasize more frequently via blood, and uh, carcinoma, which are epithelial tissue, tend to metastasize more frequently uh, via the lymph, okay? So uh, sarcomas often spread through the blood to the liver and lungs, which makes sense if it's moving through the blood, it's, it's able to, uh, that's, those are kind of stopping points, liver and lungs. Um, the carcinomas that go through uh, lymph, those are going to hit the lymph nodes first, but then they're also going to move into the blood. Okay, so these, these might be uh, the tumors that say, well, it metastasized to the lymph nodes. Okay, so that might be more, more apt to happen with a carcinoma. Okay, so this is a uh, blown up picture of a uh, metastasis taking place. Here's your tumor, and then here's the, here are the cells that are escaping that should die, but they, but they don't, and then they fall off and they uh, form somewhere else. All right, so cancer associated with genes involved in growth production. So there are some terms here that we're going to learn um, that ca can be confusing if you're not talking about them from a, uh, from a cancer perspective. But, uh, mostly because they sound like, a, it sounds bad. A proto-oncogene. Proto-oncogene. Oh, well, you know you're going to get cancer if you have a proto-oncogene. Well, that's just not true. Okay, proto-oncogenes are normal um, cell division proteins. Okay, so they're normal proteins that when they're working normally, they're supposed to be active. However, they're called proto-oncogenes, proto meaning, meaning that they can turn into oncogenes or cancerous genes by mutating. And we know that these particular genes, when they mutate, can lead to cancer. Okay, so growth factors. Yeah, we need growth factors and growth factors are, are a perfectly normal part of, you know, the cell, cell cycle. Um, but we know that when certain growth factors mutate, then it can lead to cancer. So they, so therefore we call it a proto-oncogene. Okay, so that can, that can, a mutation can form a cancer. Growth factor receptors, same thing. Uh, certain cell cycle proteins, so the signal to get there, if that's mutated and that becomes active, cancer. Cell cycle proteins, it's saying, hey, go to this, you know, this, this stable, uh, this G0, stop dividing, and if that mutates, then it won't do that. Apoptosis, there are signals that happen to tell a cell that it's time to stop dividing and to just die, uh, and that may not happen, and those are, and so that's what we call proto-oncogenes. And so proto-oncogenes, when they mutate, they turn into oncogenes, and that's, that's going to cause the cancer. Okay? So insertions, deletions, translocations, um, so something that, that is changing, uh, changing the DNA, and that's, this is insertion, deletion, translocation, that's actually talking about what's happening with the DNA, and so that's a mutation. Okay, so there are examples of genes we know that have a normal function. RAS is one, the Philadelphia chromosome. We'll learn about that. We learn about the leukemias, uh, HER2 in you. I can't remember what that one does right now. But these, we know that when these mutate, you're going to get cancer. You have a very high risk of cancer. So we call them proto-oncogenes. And then when they have that mutation, oncogenes. Um, Tumor suppressor genes. Well, you know, there are certain genes that their job is to inhibit cell division. Okay? Okay? That, I mean, if there wasn't such a thing as a tumor, we wouldn't call them tumor suppressor genes. We would just say, oh, these inhibit cell division. That's just what they do. Um, but we know that if their function 
is cut off, then cell division is going to take place. And you're going to have a lot of cell proliferation and you're going to have what amounts to cancer at that point. Okay, so mutations inhibit or decrease the ability of the, of the, cell, to, of the cell to stop growth, to stop cell proliferation division. Okay, so here's some examples. You don't really have to know all of these and what they do, uh, but these are examples of what we're talking about. So that RAS gene, um, normally all it does is it relays growth signals to the nucleus. It's just, it's found inside the cell and it's just one of these intracellular components, uh, just a protein that says, oh, we have a signal from up here. I'm going to tell so-and-so. That's all it does. Um, but, when it, but when it mutates, then what happens is that it keeps sending the signal saying, oh, yep, still supposed to grow. And, you know, the cell may be, are you sure? It's like, yep, yep, it's still supposed to grow. And there is no signal coming. Okay. So it was just a mutation in this RAS gene that's telling it to constantly keep telling that cell to divide. Okay. So there's the HER2 and U. Oh, human epidermal growth factor receptor. This is a receptor. Okay. So this is a receptor that when it's activated, it tells in this case, uh, epiderm um, epidermal cells of the breast, it tells them to divide, okay? So if this receptor is turned on, even though it's not being activated, but if it just sort of turns on and it's constitutively active or constantly active, then you're going to have uh, continued growth, and that's cancer, okay? So chromosome changes produce more copies of the growth factor, okay? So, so that's one of those examples. So where, where, you know, normally you just had, you know, a few growth factors. Here, I'll put that in a different color. So normally you just had a few of these growth factors, and now with this mutation, you're producing a whole bunch of growth factors, so it doesn't take very much signal to really activate that cell and it, and it starts to uh, starts to divide. Uh, tumor suppressor genes, so P53, that's a very popular or well-known tumor suppressor gene. It's supposed to be active and it's supposed to stop cell division. Okay, so it makes a protein to control the proliferation of damaged cells. So a cell is broken, a cell is not working the way it's supposed to. P53 is activated and it says, okay, look, you gave it a good run, but it's time to stop. It's time to die. Well, if your P53 is also kind of wonky, kind of messed up, then it's not going to give that signal. And that cell, even though it's damaged, will continue to divide. Okay? And people with mutations or partial mutations in or certain uh, sequences of these particular genes that I was just mentioning, these people tend to have a higher risk for, for cancer genetically. Okay? Um, all right, so also regulation of cell death. Remember, oh, remember BCL2. It's B cell lymphoma. We'll talk about that. Uh, but that's supposed, to, uh, that's supposed to cause apoptosis, or it's part of the chain of apoptosis when the cell is dying, and it's, it's interrupted, and that can cause a, a certain type of B cell lymphoma. Okay, so uh, stages of car carcinogenesis. So we're talking about cancer formation now. So initiation, you need that initial mutation of the DNA. Some kind of DNA damage has to happen. Okay, and our DNA is damaged all the time. Either proteins fix it or the cells die normally. Okay, but you need that initiation. Then you need the promotion. So that means that mutated cell is actually, instead of dying, it's actually stimulated to divide and it has this unregulated and accelerated growth and then the progression these tumor cells compete with one another and develop more mutations which makes them more and more aggressive and that's what we end up with here as a malignant tumor now there's one other thing we're producing a lot of cells so in cancer a lot of cells are being produced those cells have to live which means that they need a blood supply. I know this is, it's kind of crazy, all the things that a, that a cancer cell has to go through just to be a cancer cell. Uh, but for it to survive, it has to turn on angiogenesis, which is the formation of new blood vessels. So this is going to need a blood supply, okay, which it's able to form. And that's one of these um, uh, genes that's turned on, kind of a, a fetal, I guess that might be a fetal gene that's turned on, but something is turned on saying, hey, I'm a starving cell, 
And when a cell, cell begins to starve, it can send out growth signals to say, I need a blood supply. I need more blood vessels, capillaries put in here. And so that can happen. But I'll tell you what, that's a, uh, that's a great target for drugs. Okay, so they're, they're developing drugs, um, and they already have some actually, that will stop angiogenesis and it'll starve these cells. Okay, and a lot of them are antibodies that are doing this and they will, they will starve these cells and cut off that blood supply so that can cause the tumor to die. Okay, so host and causative factors. Um, I've already mentioned somewhat that uh, hereditary plays a, uh, plays a role, Men Mendelian inheritance of genes, so BRCA1, BRCA2. Um, I know that like the 23andMe uh, genetic testing now allows, allows people to look at the uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, or one or both of those, I don't know. Uh, to find out if you have these mutations and if you and if someone has these mutations they have a I can't remember the odds but an extraordinarily high chance of developing breast cancer and so a lot of people when they find out they have these genes or the the certain uh, certain mutation in these genes then they will they will just have a uh, their their breasts removed okay um, because because they know it's going to happen anyway, and it's better to do it early than to than to threaten threaten their lives by doing it after they develop cancer. Um, and so it is. It's a very very high risk. Um, you know, it's up to you whether you think that should happen. But you know, it's up to the people whether or not it does. And maybe they don't want to get breast cancer first. I get it. Um, so inheritance of defective genes involved with cell proliferation or apoptosis. Okay. All right. Reproductive hormones now. So if you think about like testosterone, okay, so that's a that's a reproductive hormone, but it also causes growth. Uh, estrogen is the same way. So sometimes these hormones uh, trigger cell growth, and that's their job is to say, hey, you know, hey, let's let's start let's start growing, let's start making you know bigger muscles, more muscles. Um, in the case of testosterone. Um, more breast tissue in the case of estrogen. So hormones often trigger cell growth and division and may promote cancerous cell division too. So one of the things they look at with these with these cancer cells, uh, especially in breast cancer, is is it estrogen sensitive? Okay, so does it have a receptor for estrogen that's telling it to further divide? And if so, then a lot of times they can block that estrogen receptor which can slow the growth. Okay, so in some ways it's kind of handy if they have that, but you know, uh, but that is that is something that that's found there. So you're you'll probably hear about that uh, at some point in your life if just a friend and they you know you hear about somebody that gets breast cancer and you'll talk about whether it's uh, estrogen sensitive or not estrogen sensitive, and it's because estrogen sensitive may be getting signals telling it to. Uh, telling it to divide or telling it not to divide or something like that. Okay, so obesity, obesity is a problem. Uh, overproduction of insulin and insulin-like growth factor. Okay, so insulin-like growth factor is a similar protein to insulin, but it actually stimulates proliferation. It inhibits apoptosis. Um, and so adipose tissue, more adipose tissue, tends to uh, cause more production of these. And... Um, and that that can then uh, increase the risk of increases the risk of cancer. Okay, so that's why obesity uh, is is um, a risk factor for cancer. Uh, immune surveillance and tumor antigens. So we develop tumors all the time, uh, but our immune system takes them out. Macrophages, T cells, natural killer cells will will take out a cell that doesn't that doesn't look right, and um, the process can be inhibited by immunodeficient diseases. So that means one of the most common one we've talked about is AIDS and AIDS people with AIDS will start to develop tumors just because their immune system is not able to stop these tumors. Okay? So cells may also change the expression of proteins that allow the immune system to recognize them so they are not killed. That's what we were talking about earlier about fetal antigens being expressed that kind of give the signal that they're supposed to be there even, even when they aren't. 
Okay, so more host and, and environmental factors, uh, chemical carcinogens, cigarettes, alcohol, diet, um, alcohol can, uh, continued use of alcohol can lead to uh, uh, cancers, increases the risk of cancer. Anything that damages DNA, RNA, or proteins involved in proliferation kind of makes sense if your cells are supposed to work right and divide the way they're supposed to, any kind of mutation is going to cause a problem with that. May directly cause changes or may be metabolized in the body to indirectly cause changes, which is what happens with alcohol and overconsumption of alcohol. And really they say that there is no lower limit that's safe of alcohol, but um, that's what they say. All right, so radiation, radiation, especially ionizing radiation. So ionizing radiation means that you have this radiation that comes down and it causes, and it boom, it knocks off electrons. And when it does that, of course, it's changing proteins, but it can also change DNA, which can cause a mutation. Okay, So it may cause just, just the uh, radiation hitting it may cause a few of these uh, bases to change. Now, one of the newer things that we're finding out more and more is uh, viruses and bacteria. Viruses and bacteria can cause cancer. Uh, pathogens may stimulate cell changes resulting in tumor formation. Currently there are four confirmed. There are others that are suspected and maybe confirmed depends on who you ask kind of thing. But we do know that HPV, human papillomavirus, and this is why uh, people get the vaccine or girls uh, get the vaccine at a uh, you know around 12, 13, something like that because many, many, many people uh, have, or have been exposed to HPV. So it's not uncommon. In fact, it's, I don't know, it's, it's over half of people. I don't know the exact percentage, but a lot of people have HPV. Um, and we know that exposure to HPV is something that can lead to cervical and esophopharyngeal cancers. Okay, So it's, it's a great treatment it's a great cure for cancer in a way, is that you prevent this virus, you prevent the cancers. It's, it's uh, you know, you want a cure for cancer, there's your cure for cancer. Uh, at least this particular uh, type of cancer caused by that virus. Epstein-Barr virus is another one. Um, it's, uh, it's involved in a lot of uh, types of mononucleosis. Uh, B-cell cancer, Burkitt's lymphoma. This is Epstein-Barr has also been found to lead to cancer. Hep A hep, or Hep B Hep C can cause liver cancers. I don't know what the process is of that, but um, probably because the damage to the liver causes those liver cells to turn on and start dividing, and that increases their chance of a mutation. Maybe uh, human T cell le leukemia virus. That's a virus that uh, that can affect T cells. But the big ones are really the Epstein-Barr, really a uh, human papillomavirus. Okay, so systemic manifestations of cancer anemia. That's the loss of red blood cells or hemoglobin or the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Anorexia, which means you've lost your appetite, so people don't want to eat, which kind of makes them thinner and can also kind of, you know, positive feedback back for anemia. Uh, bone, muscle weakness, wasting, local erosion of blood vessels, and this is what causes a lot of the pain and a lot of the organ damage. Uh, fatigue and sleep disturbances, ectopic hormones are factors secreted by tumor cells. So, um, so these are hormones that may be secreted. I mean, you may have a tumor cell that produces, remember antidiuretic hormone? You may have a tumor cell in your, uh, I don't know, in your intestine that or in your stomach or somewhere that secretes antidiuretic hormone okay and and that's going to cause um, diabetes insipidus it's going to cause you to pee all the time be thirsty all the time and even though it may have nothing to do with the location where that particular cancer is growing okay so perineoplastic disorders is what that is a range of effects at sites not directly associated with the tumor so cancer cells sometimes produce hormones or hormone like proteins and this is what I was giving the example of antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin uh, but also adrenocorticotropin hormone which releases cortisol which is our stress hormone uh, parathyroid hormone so that's going to involve calcium reabsorption so 
yeah, a tumor somewhere completely different can start messing with a different, a completely different system in the body, which is, uh, which kind of sucks. Okay, so overproduction of stress hormone leads to Cushing's. We'll talk about Cushing's at some point. Uh, abdominal obesity with thin arms and legs. That's we'll we'll get into a whole lot more about Cushing's than just that. So diagnosis, uh, cytological studies. So looking at cells, Pap smear. Okay, physically viewing the cells, tissue biopsy, so a fine needle aspiration, so you actually remove a small sample of the tissue, or you can look at tumor markers. So there's prostate-specific antigen, and you can look at levels of that and actually tell maybe, or at least, you know, confirm or monitor a tumor based on looking at these at these markers. So malignant tumors possess unique fetal proteins, like I said before, or increased expression of certain proteins. So you look for those. You look for those in the blood, and if you see them, then it's an indication that there may be a cancer pre present. So antibodies are grown that selectively bind. Okay, so, so think about this. If there are certain proteins expressed only on tumor cells that aren't supposed to be there, especially these, some of these fetal proteins, then we can produce antibodies. Remember how specific antibodies are? They're like, I like you, I don't like you. They can be produced that will specifically target these particular tumor proteins, and that can cause them to, um, <clears throat> that can cause, that can kill the tumor, supposedly, or at least control it, okay? So right now, so antibodies are grown that selectively bind to specific tumor genes. Right now, it's used for detection. Uh, but conceivably, it's uh, there, are, there are drugs that can be made, and these are some of these MAB drugs so uh, monoclonal that are produced from these monoclonal antibodies that we kind of talked about. Um, I don't know if you really understand it completely, but, uh, but yeah, they're just very, very specific antibodies for some of these things. So uh, here are some of the tumor markers. You don't have to know all these, um, but these are... You know, we keep talking about fetal proteins, and you can kind of see that uh, here are a couple of those. Here are some hormone proteins that uh, may be considered a marker if they have an increased amount or something like that. Uh, the prostate-specific antigen, uh, and then there are some other ones that I don't that I don't know uh, that are also that are also listed here. Okay, so now we have to talk about grading versus staging. Um, grading. If you grade a tumor, that's more of a microscopic examination. Okay, so that's um, so that's actually looking at the uh, looking at the cells and figuring out where they are. So that looks at differentiation, the number of mitoses or cell divisions. So a grade one will be well differentiated. That's more on the benign side, and a grade four will be poorly differentiated. So that's actually looking at the cells. Um, that's grading. So staging is more of a clinical um, examination and more of a, uh, I guess, prognosis and, and to seeing where things are going and uh, it gives you a better idea of treatment. So whereas grading is just kind of saying this is what the cells look like, staging uh, can be a little bit more useful from a clinical perspective. So radiographic surgical examination of extent and the spread, which is going to lead to decisions about treatment and prognosis. So there's TNM, T, and this is TNM staging. T stands for tumor size. So you can look at the tumor and, and determine how large it is based on a certain standard. Um, let's see. So T equals size, oh, N, N always confuse me, confuses me, but it's nodular node in, uh, uh, involvement. So lymph node is the N, lymph node involvement. Um, and so that's going to be a 0 through 3. That means if it hasn't invaded the lymph nodes, then it's a, then it's, the N is uh, a 0. And then M is either 0 or 1. It means did it metastasize or did it not? So really, the TNM is pretty simple. How big's the tumor? Has it in, does it involve the lymph nodes? If it doesn't, it's a zero. And then the more involvement you have, the higher that that uh, n number is. And then m has it metastasized or has it not metastasized? Okay. And then there's another one, the uh, zero through four, um, and that's that's a little less specific than the TNM. 
but it's just stages, yeah, stages zero through four, size of the primary lesion, presence of nodal spread, and metastasis. So it kind of look, looks at the, the same thing, stage zero, it's in situ, stage one is localized, stage two is a little more advanced, stage three is more advanced, and stage four means that it has metastasized. Okay, so how do we treat it? How do you treat these tumor cells that are growing, these, these cancers that are growing? Well, one way is to get rid of them. Okay, so you you directly remove them. Now, are you guaranteed to get all of the uh, all of the tumor? Or think about all of these little fingers that are infiltrating those little legs that it's sending out. Uh, a lot of times, you can't get all of them, uh, and so that leads to other things. Now, radiation. Now, remember, radiation. We're talking about ionizing radiation here, which we said can cause cancer. How does it cause cancer? It causes cancer by causing mutations on the DNA. So the idea is that if you have cells that are dividing rapidly, hit them with the radiation. And that radiation that uh, can damage other cells can damage, and if it's at high enough doses, can damage or even kill rapidly dividing cancerous cells. They're going, because they're rapidly dividing, they're open to uh, really bad mutations that are going to cause them to not be able to survive. I want to, I kind of want to say that again. It's killing cells that are rapidly dividing. Okay, that's what radiation does, and that's what most types of chemotherapy do. They kill dividing cells. Now, what that means is people can will lose cells in their body that are rapidly dividing that they don't want to lose, like hair growth. That's why hair falls out, because it's killing rapidly dividing cells. It's not letting them divide the way they're supposed to divide in the case of healthy tissues. But it's at the same time, it is killing these cancerous cells because they are really rapidly dividing. Okay, so uh, chemotherapy does the same thing. Chemicals that primarily target rapidly growing cells uh, drugs usually target specific stages of the cell cycle. Now, chemotherapy is a little more specific, and usually it blocks something like the ability of microtubules to form. You need microtubules to uh, to separate the DNA strands. Okay, so if you can't, if that can't happen, then any cells that are dividing in the body are going to go away, and that includes white blood cells in the bone marrow. So, so then you have immunosuppressant, your white blood cell count will drop, your hair can fall out, a lot of, a lot of things can happen, but you have to get that, that tumor cell, otherwise that's going to uh, that's gonna kill you too. That's why it always cracks me up when I see things that say, oh, this will kill cancer cells, but it won't kill any other cells, because that's, you know, if that just doesn't happen. I mean, that's, we just haven't figured out a way to do that yet. These uh, antibodies are, uh, are kind of promising for that. Anyway, so you can see here uh, chemotherapy treatment, it kills it and then you allow some of that regrowth. You have to let, you're not allowing the cancer to regrowth, regrow, what you're trying to do is to keep from killing the bone marrow. Okay, so you're trying to keep, to, to not kill all this person's white blood cells so they can't fight off any diseases. Uh, so you want to kill the tumor without killing the person. And that's what the chemotherapy stages do and um, so uh, combination therapy, multiple drugs, so different, different chemo drugs uh, kind of work together in different stages of the cell cycle to, uh, to have the, the best effect. So both radiation and chemotherapy kill rapidly dividing cells, even though we want, even those we want to keep like hair. Okay, so other treatment, hormone, anti-hormone drug therapies, drugs that reduce hormone levels or block receptors uh, that may reduce uh, cells to grow, and usually that's part of that multi-drug therapy. Uh, biotherapy and targeted therapy, so those are those monoclonal antibodies we mentioned. So they're being produced that specifically target cancer cells and label them for uh, destruction. Okay, so that can, that can happen as well. Um, so I have on this last side here just something about childhood cancer. The incidence is, incidence is greatest during the first years of life for childhood cancer, and usually they are hematologic, and we'll learn later um, specifically which 
types of leukemia are uh, children are more susceptible to. Usually it's an acute type of leukemia. Uh, it can also hit nervous tissue, soft tissues, or bone, which kind of covers a lot of it. Uh, but you won't see as much like pancreatic cancer or prostate cancer or something like that in a child. And the trouble is there's no warn early warning sign or screening tests. Uh, for these, they just kind of come out of the blue and they're, and they're pretty devastating. Okay, so that's it for um, this chapter.